Namaste. So, last time we discussed the new paradigm, the model. Uh, and I can tell from the comments, or lack thereof, and some of the messages I've been getting privately, that I don't think anybody has really understood it. What is the whole point? That the main thing in spiritual life is imagination. Imagination. Why? Because the imagination is how we create the reality that we perceive. For example, <laughs> Have you ever been depressed? When you're depressed, the whole world looks terrible, <laughs> useless, frustrating. Uh, but then, if you can deal with your depression, get out of it, and look at the world from a different point of view, it looks like a completely different place. Why? We are imagining it differently. Our model, our ontology, our background knowledge of the world has changed. This is the layer of name and form. We've talked about so many times in earlier series on this channel. But let me put it in a practical way so that you can understand. In the beginning of spiritual life, we imagine that the body is the self, that the world is real, that this life is it, huh? YOLO, <laughs> you only live once, that Creation started with the Big Bang, and so on and so forth. You know the whole song and dance. Then, maybe we started to wonder, why am I suffering? And how can I get out of it? And so maybe we started reading religious books, doing some yoga, a little meditation, you know, working on ourselves in some way. And gradually, our idea of the world begins to change. We start to see that, actually, I'm not this body. I am the being, the conscious entity within the body. I live in the body, like the ghost in the machine. Huh? The machine is external, and it's not me. It's not myself. It's not even mine, really. I'm just associated with it through karma. And when this life is finished, this gross body is going to drop off, and I'm going to be left, just as I am, with the subtle bodies. The energy body, the mind body, the intelligence body, and the consciousness body. So, then what am I going to experience? Well, there's nothing left to experience except the mind, the imagination. The imagination really is the mind. You know, as ye so think, so shall ye be or become. This is an ancient hermetic saying, aphorism. So, as we imagine things to be, so they appear to us. And when the gross body is finished, this is even stronger. 
instead of maybe 80% of our experience, it becomes 100%. So then what happens when we leave this body? If we are thinking, oh, I lost my body, <laughs> I'm dead, I'm not anybody anymore. <laughs> Then we start imagining that in order to be real, we have to have another body. So because in the afterlife state, when the upadis or coverings of the gross body are removed, our imagination becomes more powerful. And so if we imagine that, oh, I have to have another body, that starts the whole process of Paticca samupada, dependent arising, that leads to the formation of the next body. And so we come back into the material world, or the gross part of the material world, and live again. This is samsara, the round of birth and death. So how do we get out of this? When we realize, not just think, <laughs> but deeply realize that I am pure consciousness. I am not this body. I don't need this body, this gross body. In fact, I don't even need the subtle body. But if I can get over the idea that I need a gross body, then when we drop this body, we can enter another world. Now, what does that world look like? Well, that depends on how we imagine it. <laughs> Talked a long time ago about the five kinds of liberation. Moksha. So depending on your conception of the spiritual world and who you are in that world, that is what you experience after death. It's pretty simple and straightforward. The devil's in the details. <clears throat> As we imagine the ultimate spiritual state to be, that is what we experience. See? So if someone is a theist, they believe in a God, and the God has a form and a name, name and form, then we will experience that God, that form, in the appropriate setting, or context, or loka, after death. And we will have a relationship with that deity huh, according to our nature. And this is called Ishta Devata. We've talked about this many times. There's so many deities and you can have a relationship with one or more or all of them. <laughs> and in this way, you keep your individuality. But the world that you experience is the world that you imagine. Because why? It's all in your mind. Huh? Oh, I got to tell this funny story. It's out of context, but it's just so cool. Back in the days, 1960s, I was in a band with some guys from Oklahoma. And you know, Okies, Oklahoma people, are kind of really down home and simple and funny. And they told me this story. At one time they were tripping. They had taken acid <laughs> and they were sitting around, you know, goofing on this and that. And somebody said, oh, I'm seeing God, huh? which you know, he well may have been. But the others were kidding him, teasing him about it, joking. And they said, oh, it's just your imaginary mind. <laughs> I mean, they were hysterical for like hours after that. <laughs> I got hysterical too when I first heard the story. 
<laughs> it's just your imaginary mind. Well, what is the mind other than imagination? See? So as you imagine the afterlife state to be, that is what you experience. So to get back to our progression, if you are a theist, then after death you'll see your deity and the world of your deity and those pastimes and relationships and so on. Now, if you're a bhakta, you go higher. You have a direct personal relationship with the deity. And if you're a meditator, you may find yourself in the void. <laughs> because that's your conception. And then the jnani, the self-realized, fully self-realized person, they may actually merge into God or become God. Not, not a personal God, but Brahman. See, it's all according to your conception. So, during our sadhana, we try to imagine or visualize or somehow uh, experience impressions, perceptions, that are of or in harmony with our conception of the afterlife. So if someone is a devotee, uh, let's, a bhakta of, let's say, Narayana, and he's always chanting his mantra, Om Namo Narayanayam. Uh, or if he's a devotee of Shiva, he's chanting something else, Om Namo Shivaya, and so on. Every time you chant that mantra, you create an impression of that deity. So the mind is full of these impressions. And then at the time of death, I've spoken about this many times, the whole reel of the mind, the memories in the mind, is like rewound, huh? like a tape recorder or an old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Many of you may be old enough to remember them. <laughs> but when you would rewind, you would hear the, the music, huh? but going backwards at a very high rate of speed. So the same thing happens at the time of death. All the memories of your previous life go flash before your eyes in just a few minutes. And so what you're thinking of at the time of death is what you were thinking of during your whole life. So most people's thoughts, impressions, and memories are just about mundane things. Why? Because they identify with the body and they perceive and measure everything in terms of the body. But if one conceives of oneself as a subtle being, energy, prana, or mind, intelligence, or pure consciousness, huh? then he retains many impressions of the world and life from this point of view. And so at the end of life, when the tape unreels, and all the memories pass before his mental eye. He recalls that state of being. And like it says in Bhagavad Gita, whatever state of being you remember at the time of death, that state you will attain without fail. So this is the ultimate yoga. To fill our life with impressions of a higher state of existence, so that at the time of death, we remember that uh, state of being, and that's where we go in the next life. 
So you see, it's really very simple. I think a lot of teachers and a lot of traditions uh, overcomplicate the whole thing. And they also, because they're in competition with each other, they try to gain an advantage by specializing. This is called sectarianism. <laughs> Our religion is the best and all the others are bunk. Well, we don't think like that. We have a very broad view. We say that yam yam vapi smaran bhavam tyajatan de kalevara whatever state of being you remember at the time of death, that's where you go in the next life. It's up to you. You have to choose because it takes a commitment and an effort to channel one's perceptions and impressions in the direction that you want to go. So you have to decide which way you want to go. Now, I've had experience trying to teach this kind of thing to people, and they really have a tough time making up their mind. Like, who do you want to be in the next life? What do you want to be? You start working toward that now. That's your sadhana. But people have a hard time choosing. I don't know why. They don't have any problem choosing their favorite flavor of ice cream or their favorite color or their favorite TV show or whatever. But when you say, what do you want to do for the rest of eternity? They can't make up their minds. I mean, maybe they haven't found anything that they feel would be pleasing for such a long span of time. But that's okay. Whatever seems the most pleasing now, follow that, approach that, discipline your mind to remember that, think of that always. And by that thought, by that exercise of imagination, surely you will attain that state in the next life. And that is the perfection of self-realization. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.